Long Time Warp with John Romero and Craig Johnston. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Apple Time Warp, a new podcast that I'm doing with John Romero. Hey there. Who you may <laughs> remember from Wolfenstein 3D and Doom and Quake tons and, yeah, of games. It's software. But what you didn't know, maybe, is that John started doing games on the Apple II. Yeah. And he and I are on a mission to interview and speak about Apple II stuff even in 2013. So the purpose of the podcast really is to talk about Apple stuff and maybe to get some people in and talk to them about the games that they wrote back in the 1980s. So welcome, John. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. <laughs> So hopefully we'll do this on a regular basis, whatever that regular is, yeah. six months, <laughs> two months, whatever, whenever yep. we can get time. But let's start by talking about how you got into Apple II games. So what, you know, high school then, what happened? Well, in high school, um, actually, when I got out of sixth grade is when I actually started getting into programming. Uh, and it was, it was really just because arcades cost money and I really didn't have any money, so I found out that you could actually play for free on the computer, um, which led to the university in the town that I lived in in Rockland, California. And I learned how to program on a mainframe, basically, on a terminal. And uh, until they got the Apple IIs in, into the uh, computer room, I was basically doing stuff on a mainframe. Then, then these crazy new computers with color graphics and sound appeared in, in one of the rooms, and I was like, I'm done with this stupid terminal <laughs> stuff. So, um, so I started to learn how to program the Apple while I was at the university, and, um, and I did this you know, probably until, I was, until about um, almost ninth grade. I was just learning by going up there. And, uh, and I uh, eventually, my parents got... Uh, an Apple II at the house, an Apple II Plus, and we got that in 1981, and that was pretty much the end of me going outside. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I used to have a normal kid's existence, you know, riding bikes and going down to the creek, and uh, after getting the Apple, it was all over. It was all about playing games and uh, learning how to take the programming I learned on the mainframe o over to AppleSoft Basic, okay. and I started programming games in Basic on the Apple II. And so on the mainframe, what was the language you used to program games? It was HP Basic. Oh, I see. Okay, it was so an HP 9000 mainframe. So that was actually an easy translation. Oh, it was you? really easy. It was just like, what are, what are the commands to do high-resolution graphics? How do I change the color? Okay. How do I plot a dot? How do I draw a line? That kind of stuff. Um, so uh, 81 is when I actually got the computer at home. So I've been learning for two years how to code. And, um, and then finally getting one at home was, was huge. It was a big, big deal. Spent all my time doing that, and uh, I've made a lot of Apple II games, and I pretty much lived and breathed the Apple II. So I, I had I played pretty much every game that was on the Apple II. I remember everybody's names, the companies, the dates, everything, because I was a programmer, and I was in this mo this mode of remembering everything because I'm learning the memory map of the computer, how it works, and everything I'm doing, I'm remembering. So as I play all the games, I'm remembering everything about the games, the names, and all that. Right. And um, what were the what are your one of your favorite games when you were just playing, but before you started making games? Oh uh, well, you know I started making games in '79 when I was learning how to program. So the games that I played uh, were really arcade games before that point. Um, and then on the mainframe were games like Poison Cookie, Hunt the Wumpus, Nimbus, you know stuff like that. Just these mainframe text things. Uh, Adventure was like the coolest one that I had played. Then, then I started making games. Um, but then on the Apple II, I was playing everything on the Apple II, which was like where the really cool stuff was at. Um, compared to mainframe, it was not even close. You know, but, um, but Gorgon was amazing. You know, pretty much everything from, from Broderbund, from Choplifter, and Load Runner, and Droll, and uh, Gumball, you know, like tons of stuff. Like I remember all of the games from all, all the companies, I just played everything. I remember, of course, I got addicted on, to Snakebite, which is from Sirius, but I always used to think that Broderbind seemed to have the best developers, and they used to have the coolest games, like Droll, which is one of these iconic games from Broderbind, and, but they don't even do games anymore, do they? They do educational software. Yeah, yeah, they sold a long time ago. Um, but yes, uh, you know, Broderbund had a very high quality standard. Like, they were really all about quality control. Sirius was, uh, Sirius had amazing programmers, um, and you know they were very well written games. Um, they just weren't the the exact polish that Broderbund was was about. 
Um, you know, you could play a Brodeburn game and know that you were playing one because of the polish that was in it. The Sirius games were all about crazy speed and <laughs> just, you know, just like what kind of tricks can this computer do? Right. Like if you remember uh, Way Out, mm -hmm. 3D maze game, you know, that was pretty amazing. Um, back back in the day, it was like 4K of, of assembly language code right. um, that uh, Paul Edelstein wrote. And you also had a game that was well, probably many games, but one of the there was one game that you got published, and I think they even changed the name of it. Um, but how did you deal when you're making that game? How did you deal with the fact that you couldn't play sound and move graphics at the same time? And how did you get get it to do all those different colors when really the Apple only supported four colors, but people got sort of more colors out of it? Yeah, well, people got more colors out of uh, dithering, dithering colors. You know, putting colors next to other colors so close that they make another color, um, and the, and that works on the Apple II because. Uh, when you were looking at graphics on an Apple II, see, or, or like on an, a, a cathode ray tube TV, the colors bleed anyway. You know, they're not perfect square dots. They're actual like round dots that the, the light bleeds in all directions. So um, it actually could mix them, you know, pretty well, you know, on a CRT, which is the only way that it actually worked. If it was on an RGB monitor, uh, you'd see these squares of different colors next to each other and go, what? <laughs> Which is actually the emulators that they make today. You have to turn on the CRT mode yeah, you want to, see to get the fuzzy that experience. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, to exactly. actually see what it used to look like with the scan lines and all that stuff. So what was the name of your first game, and what did they change it to? When <laughs> oh, well, um, let's see. There was only um, a couple games that got the names changed, and that was uh, there was a game I made called uh, Objectoids, and it was named renamed to Evil Eye. Uh, back in, I think it was 1988, and that was because uh, Uptime was afraid of getting sued by Atari for asteroids. Oh, okay. So Object Toys became Evil Eye. Mm. And then um, and then a game that I had made called Subnodule, <laughs> this total 80s name, uh, it got renamed by a company called um, Key Punch Software. I published it on a Key Punch Software disc, and they named it to Subhunt. <laughs> right, you know, just a generic name. It's like that. That that's almost like you know, put it on Facebook. You know, it's just so generic. All right, so let's talk about Castle Wolfenstein, which is a game that my brother and I were addicted to. It was a game where you used to fight uh, Nazis and try and kill Hitler. Uh, it had all voice synthesis on it, which was incredible back in the day. But then all of a sudden, later on, we saw a game called Wolfenstein 3D, and most of us were thinking, is that the same game? Is there, you know, what's the heritage there? What's the story behind that? Well, we um, we were coming up with uh, we we had just written a texture map game called Catacomb 3D, and it was in EGA mode. And uh, we were we decided let's make a really big, really cool texture map game. And so we thought, you know, like, geez, what should we do? What kind of game should it be? Um, there was originally the idea that there could be this, um, uh, a, you know, you're you're going in to rescue scientists from a research building where all things have gone bad you know there's mutants all over the place and, and everything and uh it would you know tom hall thought it would be funny and cool to call it uh it's green and pissed <laughs> <laughs> and so that was that was a really funny uh, name but the idea was like so overdone in movies and stuff like everybody just like oh there's nothing new there you know like you think about what the premise is and there's nothing new so for some reason, um, it just popped in my head. Why don't we just do a 3D version of Wolfenstein? Ah, you know, okay. and um, and there were only four of us in the company at that time. Three of us were Apple II programmers for ten years, mm -hmm. and we were massive Wolfenstein fans. Yeah. So we're like, all three of us were like instantly. That's exactly what it needs to be. <laughs> there was zero like discussion past that point. It was like obvious we need to make this. Mm -hmm. So we started making the game, and at the same time, we we just kind of inherently knew, well, we can't call it Wolfenstein because that's owned by Muse Software. So we sort of come up with a lot of other names and nothing was as cool sounding as the word Wolfenstein. So um, when Jay Wilbur uh, was hired into id Software on April 1st of 1992, his first job was find out how we can get the name Wolfenstein. Mm -hmm. And he tracked it down to some lady who bought all the rights of Muse Software when they went bankrupt in 85. Huh. And she just held on to all the assets, and then and then we, we wanted to buy it. It's like here's five thousand bucks, boom, got it. Wow. So we, we bought the name Wolfenstein, and then actually that's what we decided to call it was Wolfenstein 3D. Um, and uh, and you know it took us six months to make that game. It's pretty quick. The the uh, the 3D renderer was written in just two months at the mm. very beginning, so we could actually make levels and build the game. 
And, um, and so it was a pretty quick process. It was just four of us for six months and we made, you know, uh, the whole game plus, uh, you know, that was like six episodes, I think we did. Mm-hmm. First one was shareware, the other ones were, were purchased and we made a hint book and everything. And, and uh, 90 something percent of everybody bought everything that we made available. Like when they called up on the hotline, they wanted the game plus the the nocturnal missions is what we call them, <laughs> and then the uh, and then the hint book, and that was sixty bucks. Wow, you know, and so everybody bought the sixty dollar package with everything in it, which Ooh. is great because Tom and I spent a lot of time putting humor into that hint book. Yeah, for sure. And and what about Spear of Destiny? So Spear of Destiny was basically uh, we had a we had an obligation to a retail publisher called FormGen for two games. One of them we had done already called Aliens Ate My Babysitter, which was a Commander King <laughs> game. And then um, and then the second game was, you know, whatever we were going to give them, they'll publish it. And they'll okay. fulfill our second obligation. So I called them up uh, at some point while we were making Wolfenstein and told them, so what I'm going to do is get the game that you guys are going to get from us, the second game, is going to be a 3D game. It's pretty cool. And uh, you're pretty much going through, uh, you know, uh, Nazi castles and just blowing away Nazis in 3D. Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, the guy at Form Gen, he's just like, um, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to stir up that World War II thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, listen, you're going to love it. You'll see. And so uh, we, we pretty much hammered out Spirit Destiny in two months after wow. we finished Wolfenstein. We finished Wolfenstein. We go on vacation. The whole company went to uh, Disney World. Nice. We're on the Grand Plan, which is five thousand bucks a head, mm. and you basically stay in the Grand Floridian, and everything you eat and everything is free. You just basically hand everyone a card when whenever money is going to be transacted and it gets paid for. Wow! So we got to do that for about a week. That was the first time that we actually met people in the world that played our games and knew who we were. So that was pretty exciting I'll for bet. us for the first time. Um, it was, you know, we were sitting in a spa and, and there was another spa next to us at the Grand Floridian and we're in, and, and the people over there were like, Hey, you guys talking about games? And like, <laughs> and, and we're like, yeah, we make games. And it's like, no way, really? What, which game? And like Wolfenstein and, you know, Wolfenstein 3D and like, Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, people know who we are. This uh-huh. is cool. Um, but we got Spirit Destiny done in two months, uh, 20 levels, you know, banged it out and put it out there, you know, gave it to form gen. And uh, it didn't really go very far just because the distribution network wasn't really huge that mm-hmm. they had. But it's another Wolfenstein game. Right. Um, so in total, we've made 80 levels of Wolfenstein before wow. we just turned our back on Wolfenstein and started making Doom. <laughs> right. But now let's talk about Sirius. NASA Jabelli, uh, was, you were saying earlier, did all the games for for Sirius. And... Yeah, he did most of the games. Uh, Chuck Somerville did Snakebite. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I mean, Sirius published a bunch of other authors, but that was, you know, the first year was big time uh, Nasser Jabelli defining the games of the company. So he left at some point, and do you have any idea what's happened to him? Yeah, well, you know, after Nasser, he wrote like nine games in 1980, 81. Like, That's he a just lot. just churned out tons of stuff. He was uh, like chain smoking, drinking coffee, just like pounding this stuff out. Um, and, uh, and he basically left and started his own game company called Jabelli Software, uh, you know, 1982. And, um, and he pumped out a bunch of cool games there, Rusky Duck and, and Firebird and, and, uh, Horizon 5 and Zenith and a bunch of cool stuff, you know, getting into some 3D. And, um, and then he made a pretty good amount of money there and he just kind of shut down, uh, Jabelli because the video game crash of 83 happened and just killed everybody pretty much. And so mm. he was a little bitty publisher. So he shut down uh, and he'd made enough money that he just went on a long vacation. And he <laughs> went on a, basically a worldwide vacation. He just tra- traveled around the world. And he eventually in, uh, in 86 came back and he was friends with Doug Carlston from Broderbund, the guy who owns Broderbund. And he came back and, and talked to his buddy Doug and said, hey, so I've been on vacation. I don't know what's happened the last few years, you know, after the crash. So can you tell me what I should do? You know, what's up? And so Doug Carlson basically said, so this thing called the Nintendo Entertainment System is <laughs> insane. It is taking over everything. And this this is 86. And, uh, and he said, you got to get back into programming for the NES. Like, it's huge. And, uh, and he said he would, you know, I'll, I'll introduce you to a bunch of people you know, that, that are publishers. And, um, and so, uh, people came, uh, I think I, I 
I think NASA remembers um, going to San Francisco for a meeting, but I also remember Doug Carlson saying that he took him to Japan to go meet with um, Nintendo and Square. Okay. And so um, NASA went over there, and, and uh, when he was talking to uh, programmers at Square, you know, they, they asked if he knew who uh, Nasha was. And he's just like, <laughs> I uh, don't know, you know, what are you talking, you know, what do you mean? Like, you know, a programmer named Nasha, he, he makes lots of great games, you know, back on Apple II. And, mm-hmm. and he's like, wait a minute, you mean Nasser? Like, that's my name. <laughs> like, oh my God, you're Nasha? <laughs> so they already knew who he was and wow. were all excited. And um, and so Nasser just basically said, okay, I'll, I'll just stay here and start making, you know, work for Square. Hmm. So he started working at Square uh, and um, he worked on a couple games, Rad Racer, 3D World Runner. Um, he, he worked like to cut his teeth on the NES. Um, so he did, they, were, they were pretty cool games. They did some really neat, neat new things. Um, and then right after that, he was asked to work on this game called Final Fantasy. And so Nasser basically wrote Final Fantasy <laughs> wow. uh, with a very small dev team. And, uh, and he wrote Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3. All three versions, the Japanese versions, over in Japan. And um, there was a little issue during Final Fantasy 2, though, because he had a, a visa to, to work over there. But during Final Fantasy 2, his visa ran out. Mm. And he had to go back to the U.S. to uh, refresh it. Um, but he's in the middle of Final Fantasy 2. So what happens is they flew the entire development team to Sacramento where he lived. And wow. they basically worked in Sacramento <laughs> finishing Final Fantasy 2 on site. Wow. And then shipped the, the you know, cartridges back to Japan. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and so Nasser basically finished you know those three games. And um, he had a really sweet royalty deal because he got there at the very beginning. And uh, you know he was friends with... Uh, Sakaguchi, Hironobu Sakaguchi, who was the guy who designed all of it, and you know he's the head guy there. Um, and uh, and then he worked on a game called Secret of Mana right after that on mm. the Super Nintendo. And so he wrote Secret of Mana. You know, had the whole ring menu system in it. Really amazing game. Um, it was planned to be a really huge game to go on the uh, a CD, exter- uh, an external CD that Nintendo was planning on putting out. Okay. So they made this game really huge, mm. and then. Um, uh, Sony was the one making the CD for Nintendo, and then Sony decided to just pull out huh. of the whole deal. And so they had this big game that they had to collapse down into a cartridge. So mm-hmm. they basically hack and slash the game mm. down into cartridge size, which is why there's a lot of weird inconsistencies and in, in holes in the game because of the way that they had to hurry up and smash it down to be- fit again back into a Super Nintendo cartridge. And uh, the CD-ROM drive tech that they did turned into the PlayStation. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> mm. so um, that was, uh, I think, you know, one of the reasons why Square um, decided to, you know, stay away from the PlayStation for so long and just stay Nintendo. Um, right. Until until Final Fantasy VII. Right. Um, but uh, you know, Nasser basically finished Secret of Mana in 1993, and he was finished making games, and that was the last time he ever worked. Too he had such a sweet royalty deal he never worked again wow and he's been basically just living in sacramento hanging out <laughs> going on trips and stuff and you were you were saying earlier before we started that well, most game developers all game developers can trace their the influence back to back to nasa Jabelli, and, and bill budge you right know? you know people are influenced by someone usually like if you're a game programmer uh you're in, influenced usually by another programmer and that programmer was influenced by someone else, and that guy was influenced by someone else, all the way down to usually Nasser Jabelli or Bill Budge. Those are Amazing. the two people that are at the root of, of all games, typically, and microcomputers. And that's because and when the Apple II came out, that was the platform to write games for. Yeah, and they were the first ones. And that right. was before any Atari 800s or Commodore 64s or any of the popular 80s computers were even out. The Apple came out in 1976, the mm. Apple II in 77. And um, that's really where all the earliest stuff was written. Right. And we off topic, but what about the developer of Droll, Ike Bang? Yeah, you, you've yeah. got a funny story to tell us about Ike Bang. And yeah. is he a real person? That's that's the question. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Droll was an amazing game by Broderbund. Um, and also, you know, so we were talking about Serious Software earlier. Serious Software had their own stable of amazing developers. 
Um, there were these two brothers, uh, Tony and Benny Ngo, I think is how you say their last name. Um, and they had done bandits and uh, they had done gamma goblins. And, you know, they're really, really good. And um, back then when you worked for a publisher, you were kind of like part of the family. You, you didn't go outside the family and go like write a game for the competitor. That right. would be like evil. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically this game, Droll, comes out by someone named Aik Bang, A-I-K-B-E-N-G. Um, and, uh, you know, no one knew actually that that was, I think, Benny Ngo. That was, that was his middle names. It was Benny Aik Bang Ngo. <laughs> so he was moonlighting, right? You know, for for the other team, basically. Uh, you know, he just wanted to get more games out there, I guess. Yeah. And people ask from still on forums when people are saying, you know, we never hear from this guy, Ike Bang. Yeah, but no, actually, we'll never hear. Never hear from him. <laughs> it's a secret. There so, are actually a lot of secrets. Yeah, I'm sure there is. <laughs> we we need like, to do this in the next show, I think. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so now let's talk quickly about uh, what's happening currently with Apple II stuff, because you have a great collection of things that people are always sending you stuff. Yeah, so what's I, going on these days with Apple II kit and software? Um, well, you know, so I'm part of a software collectors group uh, as well. We keep track of, like, the things that are going on with eBay. And, you know, when, you know an Akalabeth comes out. And everybody deeply analyzes the Acalabeth that's on eBay, like who's selling it, what their history is, if they're a known uh, counterfeiter, mm. um, you know, uh, everything that there is to know. They dissect anybody that puts anything up there, you know, if it's actually real mint, sealed in box, or whatever it is. They know exactly how to tell if the disc label was actually the correct kind for the disc at that year. Mm. Like they know everything. And um, and so you know things that come up there are pretty interesting. They just had a um, they just had an Acalabeth go for oh no an Ultima two, uh, big box Ultima two from Sierra Online, mm-hmm. um, go for uh, about eighteen hundred dollars. Wow! And I have one of those All right. sealed in box. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. well, I'm sure the price will go up <laughs> um, at some point. But uh, so there's you know lots of this uh you know there's software just gets older and gets more valuable as time goes on the earliest software uh is software that was sold in ziploc bags and the very first computer stores that sold software uh basically had a bunch of you know wires hanging out of the walls with ziploc bags hanging off of them you know like like when you go to the grocery store and there's a bunch of candy hanging on a rack okay um, and so that's what computer stores were like. And they usually didn't have anything in the middle of the room. Like all the <laughs> software is hanging on the wall. And those were the really earliest games. You know, they were like in 1981, pre, pre 81 and like in 80, 82 is when boxes really started to appear. Um, and so, uh, I have a bunch of that stuff. I have a bunch of baggy games, you know, multiples of different games and, and people that are collectors are excited about those kinds of things. And, um, and so I just uh, recently got a uh, bo- several boxes from Mark Pilzarski, who used to be the owner of Penguin Software. And um, he basically decided to clean out his closets, and he's kind of <laughs> done with all the stuff, and he's just, like, sent me his stuff. And so I got some cool new software. I got some hardware peripherals. Um, the hardware peripherals, I want to find, like, some serious Apple hardware collectors to... Um, get this stuff to. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't specifically collect hardware, Apple hardware, unless it's an actual Apple computer, but I, but these peripherals are not computers. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but it's cool to be able to get stuff like that. Um, when Silas Warner died in, I think it was 2005, uh, his widow contacted me and basically gave me everything that he had when he died. So mm-hmm. I got the master disc for Castle Wolfenstein when he was writing the game. Wow. Um, all the Muse software stuff, uh, early cassette tape stuff from 1978, like retail displays that they used to sell in the stores. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, his red book, the Apple II reference book, the red book that had Waz's handwritten stuff in it. I got his red wow. book. Um, just all kinds of cool old stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, I collect I collect a lot of Apple II stuff, and I love getting my hands on any kind of uh, Ziploc baggy games because they're the oldest. Right, and also you um, are in touch with a lot of the uh, the old developers anyway, so that's going to be great when we can try and talk to them on the show. It'll be good to get them in. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I'm in touch with most Apple II developers. So I can find them. Um, 
you know, people who are close by uh, Chuck Somerville who wrote Snakebite, mm-hmm. um, he, he has a, a rewrite of his Chips Challenge game. It's called Chuck's Challenge. You can go to Chuck'sChallenge.com. And it's available on pretty much every platform. It's on PCs, it's Android, it's iOS, you know, everything. And uh, and it's a really cool, like, 3D version of Chip's Challenge. It looks really good. Hmm. Um, and he's a super nice guy. He's nearby. He's got so many awesome stories from the serious days. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe on the next show I'll, I'll talk about a cool secret thing that I found out from him. Oh, about yes. About Lord British. Can't That's wait. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, you know, there's there's a uh, Stuart Smith who's very hard to find because his name is so common. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, he is a guy who wrote Alibaba and the Forty Thieves and wrote the adventure construction set that mm. adventure construction set that shipped, um, I think, in 1985 from EA. Um, so he lives up in Grass Valley, so he can be interviewed. He's pretty close by. Steve Baker, Steve A. Baker, S. A. B. The guy who created Soft Tape. <laughs> Nightcrawler, bunch of real early uh, rocket fighter, you know, really early games. Um, he lives nearby, so he's a friend on Facebook. Um, he's like one of the earliest game makers on the Apple II. You know, he's as early as Bob Bishop was back in the wow. very beginning. Um, Paul Ludus, if you remember Paul Ludus, uh, he wrote Graph Forth and Apple Writer. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, you know, all these guys are around here. Tons of them. Bill Budge works at Google down the street. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, uh, Mark Tremell's in California. You mm-hmm. know, he's down in San Diego, but you know, he's a guy who who made Beer Run, you know, Free Fall, uh, Sneakers, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of really cool stuff. But yeah, everybody, you know, tons of those people around here. Warren Robinette comes out here uh, on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Howard Scott Warshaw's out here. Hmm. Just tons of people. And what's good is that even if they're not close, Skype is always around for you to jump on and chat anyway, right? So yeah. we can always do it. That's yeah. that's the joy of having things like that and high-speed internet these days, so you can just talk to anybody wherever they are. Yeah, I've been um, doing... Uh, I, I have a thing, a site called the Romero, Romero Archives, and um, I basically am interviewing game programmers slash designers from the early days about the process and how they coded and everything, you know, like in detail, 6502 detail. And um, I've been doing in-person um, video interviews, but the, the very earliest ones I did over Skype, like um, Chris Crawford. I uh, did, did a, an interview with him over Skype talking about Storytron and, and what he's doing. Um, and uh, Don Daglo and, uh, you know, just Bob Bates and mm-hmm. Sid Meier and, you know, just the Serotex, just tons of people I've been uh, interviewing. I even got to interview Mark Pilzarski for a couple hours when I was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm continuing to do that, and this show can be kind of part of those archives. Yeah, that'll be awesome. And, you know, one last thing I was thinking of is Jordan Mechner uh, uh, recently re-released Karateka. Where he says Karateka. Yeah. The way he pronounces it. I've always said Karateka. Everyone and, said Karateka and it is Karateka. <laughs> and what was the most amazing thing is when you used to play that game as a kid, you would think, wow, this is so realistic. They've got the movements down and everything. And when you watch that, it's, he talks about how he would film his father, you know, doing those movements. And it's the most incredible thing that, that he had all that, that forethought to do all of that for a game. Yeah, you could actually download the book as well on Kindle, um, which is the making of Karateka, and he has the making of Prince of Persia as well. And you can see, uh, well, from reading the book, you can see how he was just conflicted. Like, he didn't know if he even really wanted to make games. Mm. You know, he was just really good at it. But he really wanted to make movies or Mm. write movies. So the whole way that you're reading this book, you're like, oh, my God, he might not make games. You know, And, Mm. and it's funny because he's just conflicted you know but he but he uh he cut so many classes in school to make karateka <laughs> and he has a whole journal at home uh i went to i went and just had a pool party at george mechner's place nice. not too long ago with uh, rob pardo the lead designer of world of warcraft so mm-hmm. we brought all our kids over to the house and uh and so we had this pool party but he's got you know jordan at his amazing house in la has this really awesome office in the backyard a whole separate building that you go into and it's all game stuff everywhere mm. and he's got basically he showed me his karateka journal that he hand wrote and everything and he kept track of which days which classes he skipped on those days so he didn't skip them the next time so he could interleave <laughs> skippings right and when he worked out 
when he went to the gym, how many hours he spent working on the game, like in meticulous detail, he kept track of everything as he was making Karateka wow. for some reason. Hmm. And, um, you know, the game did have a lot of really interesting uh, features like the rotoscoping that he did for the, for the animation. And he had those ideas by talking to other people. And it took him years to make Karateka. Hmm. Like, it was not like he just jammed it out really quick. This took a long time, but he got so much encouragement from people about how great the game was looking that kept on pushing him. But it was so funny to read in the book just like how little he worked on it because he was just busy doing all kinds of other fun stuff, you know? <laughs> and so um, it's, it's you know, we're lucky the game came out, basically. Okay. <laughs> and um, and he, he just had a lot of cool stuff going on. It's a really great book to read, The Making of Karateka. I almost um, get that. You should totally get it. It's I loved reading it because it reminded me of everything in the Apple II era. I mean, he... He's naming every game that's out and, and like what he thinks about it. And it's like this came straight out of the journal. He wrote those things down at the time. So everything is 100% at that time when he was playing those games. And, and like this new game just came out, you know, it's you know, a swashbuckler. And so he's talking about these games that everybody remembers playing if they were on the Apple II. And he's talking about it like right then mm -hmm. and what he thought about it and everything. It's so cool. So when he said Swashbuckler, it reminded me that the guy who did Swashbuckler and Aztec, that, that's somebody we need to talk to. Because yeah, those were games that took yep. up days, months, and years of my life. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he did a really great job. Um, what's funny about that is, um, you know, Paul Stevenson used the same engine from uh, Swashbuckler to make Aztec. You can tell because of the filled-in characters and stuff. And Swashbuckler was was on a plane, just one line. So you just went left and right. It didn't have any kind of angles and stuff, which is what Aztec did when he had yeah. stairs and everything in there. So funny uh, enough, um, you know, Aztec came out in 1982, and uh, I think it was Data Most published it or Data Soft. And uh, I went to work at Origin, uh, at Origin Systems in 1987. So it was like five years. So while I was at Origin Systems, we got a submission from Paul Stevenson for a game on the Commodore 64. It was like this new game he just wrote. So mm -hmm. I'm like, the guy who wrote Swashbuckler and Aztec? Seriously? <laughs> I gotta see this. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. And when we, we ran the game, I don't even remember what the name of the game was, but he used the same engine from 1982. What? Like, wow. he made nothing. He didn't make a new, like, engine or technology. He just used the same one, and it was on a Commodore 64. But it was still like the same solid white characters and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh no, you didn't advance, <laughs> you know? Um, Origin didn't publish the game, but uh, but yeah, we still have really good memories of like, wow, it's the same, like you're dying in the air. Okay, <laughs> you know, you're floating in space with some stars around your head. Again, still, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, his stuff was really great. Everybody remembers those games. They do, yeah. Well, I really hope that we, we do this often and, uh, and, you know, and we've got a lot more stories to talk about, of course, and then upcoming shows and more information to share. So this has been great. Yeah, same here. Awesome. Thanks very much, John. All right. We'll talk again you. next time. All right. See ya. Bye, everyone. Bye.